Currently, pro-Russian Transnistria is a republic not recognized by the international community, which seeks independence from Moldova. For the Kremlin, it is an important point on the map of influence, one of the westernmost. Moldova does not have sufficient operational capabilities to defend its own borders. Chisinau is threatened by the ongoing war in Ukraine and Moscow's aggressive policies. Today, Vladimir Putin again threatened Kiev's political allies with nuclear war. Western countries are talking about the possibility of sending NATO military contingents to Ukraine. We too have weapons that can raise targets on their territory. They should understand that their decisions risk a potential nuclear conflict, and that means the destruction of civilization. After the outbreak of war in Ukraine, Moldova increased its independence from Russian gas. In turn, when the authorities in Kiev decided to close the borders, pro-Russian Transnistria was cut off from trade with Ukraine. Russia began to view Moldova as a real threat to its position in the region. In addition, yesterday Transnistria asked Russia for help with its economic blockade by Moldova. This is indeed Moscow's modus operandi for the last 30 years. As if we look back still at the traditions of Tsarist Russia. It was always the Tsar of Moscow or from St. Petersburg who referred to his role as a protector or collector of Russian lands and protector of all these minorities. From the point of view of Russia controlling Transnistria, popular pro-European political sentiment in Moldova is dangerous. That is why the Kremlin intends to overthrow the government of the pro-EU president, Maya Sandu, elected in 2020. It is the Russian intelligence who is supposed to be responsible for coup attempts, disinformation and inciting the population to revolt. Putin is not at all concerned with taking control of Transnistria in order to support these people later and improve their standard of living, but actually to destabilize the situation in that region and when the time is right to carry out aggression. But of course he must first achieve his goals in Ukraine. We are entering an election year for Moldova. Maya Sandu, the pro-Western president, will be vying for re-election, and the Russians are using all means to destabilize Moldova. And they will certainly take advantage, first from Transnistria, and second from Gagazia, which is ruled by Baskan, meaning a governor, with a pro-Russian view. U.S. experts do not rule out that the Kremlin may take steps to strengthen the position of separatists in Transnistria, which could lead to a conflict. However, with the current course of the war in Ukraine, such a scenario is unlikely. From the south, from the southwest, it would provide such a base of operations into Ukraine so that possibly it could be better settled and perhaps in the future from there to strike at Ukraine itself and moreover, not only to affect other countries, including in the first place, of course, Moldova. The Russians in Transnistria do not have the kind of forces that would be able to attack Ukraine or attack Moldova. Transnistria seceded after the war in the 1990s, but still formally, it is part of the Republic of Moldova. What could a more aggressive Russian policy in the region lead to? Perhaps to a situation like that in Chechnya, which it annexed in 1996 after two years of brutal war. To this day, the Kremlin continues to successfully use its influence in the region. Two weeks ago, two Chechens hired by the Russian government murdered Russian defector Maxim Kuzminov. The pilot was shot dead in an underground parking lot in Spain. The current regime is much more dangerous than the previous ones, and that's because today they are fighting for their lives. They are convinced that if they lose, they will be brought before an international tribunal that will make them answer for all the crimes and misdeeds of the last 30, 40 years for Chechnya, for Syria, for Georgia, and now for Ukraine. At the December European Council summit in Brussels. A decision was made to start accession negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova. The latter country applied for membership in the European Union in March 2022. And since spring 2022, reports have surfaced indicating that Russia intends to expand the war in Ukraine to Moldova and Transnistria. 
Poland doesn't rule out introducing a ban on agricultural products from Russia. The Polish prime minister said on Thursday during a visit to Warsaw by his counterpart from Latvia, which has already implemented such a ban. Like much of Europe, Poland has been gripped by protests in recent weeks as farmers demonstrate against European Union environmental regulations and what they say is unfair competition from Ukraine since the bloc waived duties on imports in 2022. However, Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk said agricultural products from Russia and Belarus were also causing market distortions. Latvia has decided on an embargo when it comes to Russian products. This was the decision of the Latvian Parliament. I would like to say that we will study this Latvian decision very carefully, and I do not rule out that Poland will also take the appropriate initiatives here. I want everyone to understand that the problem of food and grain surpluses in Poland and Europe, the problem of unequal competition, it is not solely a problem of grain and food imports from Ukraine. Few people realize that our market in Europe and in Poland is being destabilized by products coming from Russia and Belarus. So we need to take all possible measures to stop that. And here, dear Evika, I want to thank you that we are going to do this together in Brussels in order to persuade the European institutions to take this very seriously. We discussed the need to provide all the necessary political, financial and military support to Ukraine. In this context, we agreed that further sanctions should be imposed on Russia. That's why we will be cooperating on the grain issue as well. We see as a potential where we can ban those products and suppress Russia's uh, power and Russia's economy. In parallel, we continue to work for more efficient implementation of those sanctions that are already in force. Tusk was due to meet the farmers' leaders later on Thursday. On Thursday, French President Emmanuel Macron promised to take a swim in the River Seine one day as he officially inaugurated the 2024 Olympic Village and praised the legacy the Games will leave to Paris, including a swimmable river. The keys to the 52-hectare village just north of Paris along the Seine were officially handed to the Olympics organizers on Thursday. It will host some 14,500 athletes and their staff before welcoming 9,000 for the Paralympics. For Parisians, there will be significant legacies in terms of infrastructure, in particular with the Seine. We know that for the Seine and the Marne rivers, there has been extraordinary investments done by the municipalities, by the state. The regional prefecture has made a lot of commitments on this matter and coordinated all the actors, including the water agencies and others. And for the Ile-de-France residents, we will also have the Marne River that will have a new face and usage tomorrow. And that's formidable. Yes, there have been commitments made. And will you swim in the River Seine? Well, of course, yes, I'd go in. When? I won't give you the date, or you risk being there. Paris has been working on cleaning up the Seine River so that people can swim in it again, as was the case during the 1900 Paris Olympics. But a sewer problem last summer led to the cancellation of a pre-Olympic swimming event. Macron is not the first French politician to promise to swim in the Seine. Paris mayor Anne Hidalgo said she would do so more than three decades after her predecessor, Jacques Chirac, famously promised to do it in the presence of witnesses, but never did. Scientists in Norway released five foxes this month from an ongoing captive breeding program aimed at rebuilding the population of Arctic foxes in their natural habitat. But prey for Arctic foxes, lemmings and small rodents are crashing in population numbers as climate change delivers more rain and less snow across their natural northern range in Scandinavia. Uh, captive breeding for Arctic foxes was set up in 2005 um, as a conservation initiative. There were very few Arctic foxes remaining at that time in Scandinavia, as few as possibly 50 individuals. The aim of the captive breeding station is to produce uh, pups, offspring, that are raised at the facility here. And then uh, once they become adults, they're then released out into the wild. 
into various populations. Frozen rain on top of snow makes it hard for lemmings to dig barrows they need to stay warm, which means the foxes are struggling to find enough to eat. That's why the scientists breeding them in captivity are also maintaining more than 30 feeding stations across the Alpine wilderness, stocked with dog food kibble. As part of the state-sponsored program to restore Arctic foxes, Norway has been feeding the population for nearly 20 years, at an annual cost of around 3.1 million Norwegian krona, or 275,000 euros, it has no plans to stop anytime soon. Since 2006, the program has helped to boost the fox population from as few as 40 in Norway, Finland and Sweden to around 550 across Scandinavia today. Climate change definitely has a potential to affect the re-establishment of Arctic foxes. Mostly it's probably going to be through their, the effect it will have on their prey and especially their preferred prey, lemmings and other rodents. If, the, if we get warmer, warmer and more unstable climate where you get snow melt and you get icing on the ground, that is going to affect how well the rodents can survive. Fox pups are bred and raised in an outdoor fenced enclosure near Opdal, a remote site some 400 kilometers north of Oslo where scientists monitor their health and development and try to prevent them from being attacked by eagles before being released into the wild the following winter. The foxes had been driven to near extinction across Scandinavia by hunters seeking their winter white fur before they gained some reprieve in hunting bans and protections introduced in the 1920s and 1930s. Arctic foxes have since emerged as a symbol of the far north. The Arctic fox is featured in the logos for both the Arctic Council and Swedish outdoor brand Fjallraven. I think we've come a, come a long way in saving this species. We've already seen that the population is uh, rising. It's, it's getting, we're getting larger subpopulations and we're getting more exchange of individuals between populations. But I still think we have some way to go before we, we, we can say that we've really saved the species. At the current population, scientists said it could take another 25 years to reach the program's goal of 2,000 Arctic foxes running free through Scandinavia, provided the foxes' bellies are kept full.